Good evening, everyone, and welcome to 2024. It's a new year, and I thought the best way to start it out would be to do a political roundup of what's going on uh, in Canada, uh, in the provinces across Canada, and, and in the city of Toronto, and maybe some other cities. And so I've uh, assembled an incredible uh, panel for you tonight of some uh, wonderfully interesting people that have been very successful in their own careers, as well as in politics uh, across the political spectrum and frankly, across the country. So joining us from the the the, the, the left coast, the West Coast is uh, Sarah McIntyre, who uh, was principal spokesperson for Stephen Harper at one point in time when Stephen Harper was uh, was Prime Minister of Canada. She also worked for Christy Clark uh, in uh, what was a Liberal government, uh, sort of, uh, in British Columbia. Uh, and she's now with uh, the, uh, I think it's called the Convenience Association of, uh, Canadian Historic Association of Canada. Um, so very knowledgeable about uh, Ontario, British Columbia, uh, and uh, Canadian uh, federal politics, particularly from a conservative uh, standpoint. Mark Keeley is coming to us from Mississauga. And uh, he, uh, he worked for John Turner. Um, and uh, was very involved in the Liberal Party uh, and has been very involved in the Liberal Party over the years. Uh, currently runs a uh, public affairs, government affairs consulting company called, I believe, Keeley Associates. And Kim Wright is with us, and she also has a great uh, political involvement. Uh, she runs a uh, public, public affairs strategy uh, company. Uh, I think it's called White Strategies. Um, and uh, and she's been very involved in the New Democratic Party um, and uh, very involved with Olivia Chow and uh, Andrea Horvath and uh, and new New Democratic uh, politicians in the past. You know, we've got an incredible panel and we've got a lot of issues to talk about. I think that, uh, you know, whether it be uh, inflation and interest rates or debt, uh, affordability, um, taxes, uh, you know, elections uh, that are going to happen for sure in the United States that might happen in Canada. Uh, and um, there was an interesting article in the Globe and Mail yesterday that said that over 50 percent of the world's population are going to be voting in elections uh, this year. Uh, and so therefore, is this the uh, zenith of democracy or is it a, a challenge for democracy? I'd like to cover all of these things. And so let's start with um, federal politics, if we could. And uh, Sarah, maybe I can uh, start with you. Uh, Pierre Polyev has done unbelievably well in the polls. Um, is he going to win the next federal election? Hundred percent, yes. <laughs> no question about it. Uh, what else would she say? <laughs> no question. Yes. No question. Look, in, and it, it's it's as much about Pierre as it is about the cycle of politics. Um, you know, we do this. Yeah, you know all the time in Canada. We we throw we go in with one party, we give them a lot of chances, and then by the third term, I call it third termitis, everybody starts to sour. You can't come back from it. Everything you touch is a disaster. Everything is an ethical scandal. Uh, you can't put one foot right in front of the other. And that's exactly where Justin Trudeau is right now. And Pierre's benefiting from that, but he's also benefiting from you know broadening his base. He's got lots of fundraising in. He's got lots of issues all those pocketbook issues are are like tailor made for for a conservative, and and Pierre's cashing in on it. And you know you see it. Uh, you know this is exactly why Trudeau came out with the heating oil exemption in Atlantic Canada. Pierre's po uh, popularity was even breaking into Atlantic Canada, so they were in in big trouble. So yeah, I you know unless you know in in politics is a funny game anything can happen but with things as they are now absolutely pierre becomes the next prime minister mark the big article in the global mail yesterday as well was that uh leaders stay on too long um and that they quoted a whole bunch of leaders whether it be biden or trudeau uh, even margaret thatcher that didn't know when it was the right time uh, to leave should trudeau leave well look there's some people that are saying that he should and that there's um an awful lot of if you look at the polls, I mean, people are getting, I, I agree with Sarah, people get tired after a while uh, of uh, of folks who have been around, they say, for too long. But look, this is a very resilient guy. This is a very resilient party. I think that Justin Trudeau has done a spectacular job of leading this party, of putting people in uh, positions in his party that have uh, been loyal to him as a leader. And so I don't think he wants to go. Uh, Brian, I think he wants to stick around. I think he's a great campaigner. I think that Canadians will see and they will feel, you know, look, we're not a uh, we're not a right of center country, as some would suggest. Uh, we're more middle of the uh, the political spectrum as a, as a country per se. And I think there's a very efficient number of people in this country. When I say efficient, I mean that it's a it's a uh, across this, the political spectrum in Canada that people will say, look, I think this has been a good government and he'll stick around and lead it for another election. 
him. Uh, Jagmeet Singh has, uh, you know, said recently that uh, a coalition government is off the table, not a chance. Uh, he's had this uh, um, supply agreement, confidence and supply agreement uh, for what, two years now. Um, should he continue it into 2025 or should he uh, terminate it and trigger an election in 2024? And if that happens, what do you think would happen to the NDP? And so I think it's, it's an important distinction to make that the confidence and supply agreement, if it gets terminated because the liberals aren't le living up to the the terms of the agreement it does not automatically trigger an election that will be then confidence votes and it'd be like the normal course of a minority parliament there'll still be uh votes to be had and conversations to be had on issue by issue basis but it does not automatically trigger an election so i think it's always just important to level set that with the viewers with with politics uh with media often i'm often having to explain that but this confidence and supply agreement has been good for Canadians. They have gotten dental care out of this. Nine million Canadians will get access to dental care. Young people, seniors, peer, persons with disability. This is massive. And before I hear the, the chorus of crowds going, oh, but it's too expensive. And then, first of all, the amount of money it will save on the healthcare system overall, because those people will not be going into emergency care, uh, is, is astronomical. The mental health, when your teeth are well taken care of, you're actually able to do more on a mental health, being able to go out and get jobs in a way that you couldn't before. And also, if the Liberal government's got $16 billion to give to Volkswagen to come to a town, they sure as heck got it to make sure that Canadians' health and well-being is taken care of. So you have that. You've got Pharmacare coming in. And Tommy Douglas would used to say... If I had to do it all over again, it's great that we got doctors and universal health care. But all that means if we don't have pharmacare is you know what you're dying from. And being able to deal with these major significant issues in a minority parliament is exactly what Canadians sent to Jagmeet Singh and the Democrats back to do and what they sent parliamentarians back to do. So I think this is a good year. Jagmeet uh, and his wife just had their second baby. He's got a spring in his step. He knows what he's fighting for and will... Uh, and, We'll, uh, we'll get there. So, um, so here. you think that the confidence and supply agreement will not be broken this year? I think that will fundamentally depend on if the Liberals decide to deliver on Pharmacare. If they keep dragging their feet on Pharmacare, there is no way this confidence and supply agreement can continue. They made meaningful steps on it at the end of this year. Uh, we've extended it out until the uh, end of Q1, and uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But right now, every party is now starting to look at who are our candidates? What are we all looking at in the next election? That becomes a big problem, uh, in particular for Pierre Polyev. Some of the candidates that they've nominated, some of the, chat, the, the, the fumbles they've had is really going to hurt him. And those astronomical polling numbers are going to be a problem for him if he doesn't nominate candidates that are reflective of Canadians' values. So, Sarah, that's, a, you know, that's an issue. I've heard from numerous people, some in fact, in the Conservative Party, that said that uh, it was a takeover by uh, uh, by the uh, by the ultra right wing, by the anti vaxxers of the Conservative Party that got uh, Pierre Polyev elected, and that a lot of the people that are now controlling riding associations, uh, if they want to exercise that uh, that that power, that uh, that influence, um, are uh, people that would be frankly more comfortable in uh, in in Maxime Bernier's party, and uh, and that therefore there will be an issue when you compare what Pierre Polyev is saying versus what the people that are nominated to be candidates might be saying. What do you think uh, of that? Well, at the end of the day, it's always the leader that ends up signing off who the candidate is. And um, so I, I'm pretty confident that the team that Pierre has around him are, are keen to those kind of uh, pitfalls that um, seem to only plague the Conservative Party. Um, but yeah, I look, I... I think that they're going to be going through that with a fine tooth comb that they're that they literally are the government in waiting and so we'll be applying those thresholds and, and checks appropriately so you know with with any party look it's a big country there's a lot of ridings there's going to be you know candidates that are are one issue there's going to be candidates that are you know amateur and going to misstep that's the nature of, of politics so you've got to build a big coalition um and so that that's going to happen, um, but is it going to take them completely off course? I, I 
I don't think so. I think the team around Pierre and Pierre's um, experience, you know, he's very well experienced in, in new parties. You know, he was at the fore with when the Conservative Party began. So he's learned these lessons. So, um, you know, to say that it's not going to happen. Yeah, I think there'll be some step missteps along the way. That's the nature of the game. But is it going to take them off course from winning? Absolutely not. Mark, you know, some people are saying that uh, Pierre Polyev is uh, is a right wing Republican, just like uh, um, Trump in the United States, and that the Liberal Party has made a big mistake in not going out and trying to brand him. Uh, that has given him, you know, a year, if not more, of free time to uh, to brand himself rather than doing what the Conservatives did to Michael Ignatieff or Stefan Dion by branding uh, them uh, very early. Have uh, have the Liberal Party has the Liberal Party made a big mistake? You know, you you, you read comments that Justin Trudeau is making, he's relishing a fight against this guy because of the way he's positioned, but yet they're not they're not out there talking about it today yet. I'll say at the outset, Brian, I think it's a ridiculous uh, comparison to suggest that Pierre Polyev is like the uh, Donald Trump of the United States. And I, I think those folks who are making that kind of comparison are making a bad mistake. And I'm not certain that the Liberal Party per se is uh, espousing that as a uh, as a good comparative for, for Pierre Polyev. I will say this, and I think you'll see in 2024 a lot more of this narrative that comes out where they're saying what Pierre Polyev has done, and even for all intents and purposes, what Jagmeet Singh has done is given a to-do list to the uh, to the current government, the liberal government, and they'll take that to-do list and benefit by it. You know, I just I, I like uh, I like to use the comparator of uh, of when uh, Bob Ray, when he was the um, leader of the opposition in 1985 during that election you'll remember this kim and signed that agreement from 85 to 87 all those wonderful things happened and the liberals got the benefit of it and formed a, a, a majority government in 1987. i'm going to say to you that that to-do list that we've had over the last year and a bit um, is certainly going to benefit this government and in 2026 when there is a an election I don't know, Kim, if you guys are going to be, or you, Sarah, if you're going to be so uh, happy to think that you're the government in waiting. So let me ask you a, a question about uh, the, the agenda and pharmacare, if I could, Mark. Um, you know, I've had several economists on my show that have said that our debt is at all time high and, yeah. and it's unsustainably high. Uh, yeah. And that uh, the one thing they've said is that they don't think that uh, the Liberal Party will actually institute pharmacare, that pharmacare would be the straw that breaks the camel's back from a debt standpoint. And so while Kim talks about how critically important it might be, it is unbelievably expensive. And most economists in Ottawa that track the budget, um, including the former budget officer, Kevin Page, and people like that, um, will say that we just can't afford it. Uh, do you think pharmacare will be instituted? And or if it's not, will that be the end of uh, the Liberal government because of the supply and uh, confidence? Well, there's a lot more that needs to be talked about in terms of pharmacare. I mean, the provinces have to play a role in this as well. And I, I think so. I think you're going to have to. And, and I've been saying this to the government, too. I, I think we have to, to see a lot more uh, cooperation and collaboration between the provinces and the feds. That's really got to uh, come to the fore, Brian, before we see that this thing's going to happen. There's an awful lot that has to happen with pharmacare. And it's a very complicated issue, notwithstanding. Uh, so, you know, I uh, look, uh, there are people that are suggesting that it should all be uh, generic medications when there are uh, others that say that it ought to be both uh, generic and branded uh, um, or, or biologics or biosimilars, all of those kinds of, it's a very complicated issue. So I'm not certain that, you know, haste is, is where we're going to go on this issue. And so I think getting it right is probably more important. And if that takes time, it takes time. Sarah, I got to ask you about uh, carbon taxes. Uh, you know, Pierre Polyev is still talking about carbon taxes uh, and how bad it is over and over and over again. COP, uh, whatever it is, 29 or whatever it was that just happened, uh, you know, uh, re, um, re spoke, re initiated, re, uh, re, um, uh, reminded us all about how critically important, if we believe it, uh, that uh, climate change is and how we've got to make efforts. Is the Conservative Party and the Pierre Polyev on the right track on carbon taxes and on, uh, on the climate change? Yeah, it, it's funny. I, I always get annoyed by this conversation because it's like if you're against Sorry. carbon tax, then you're you're you, you're a climate denier. Carbon tax is one tool and one policy lever to accomplish certain ends for climate change. Uh, you can believe in climate change and not believe that a carbon tax is going to do anything to curb behavior that is contributing to climate change. 
So like that is, that is, that is a, the basis where we should start the conversation. And we've had the carbon tax long enough and, and does, is it impacting our, our emission levels? I, I think what Pierre's, you know, focused on right now is the affordability piece and people are seeing how much uh, the carbon tax is costing each household. And at a time when affordability is a crisis and people are on the uh, edge of homelessness because they can't pay their heating bills or fill up their tank of gas, um, then this is uh, one lever that they can uh, relieve affordability issues. So I think what's happened is, is that people are more concerned about affordability issues than they are about climate change right now. And so he's on the right track in terms of saying, we're gonna bring relief by axing the tax. And I think, you know, you saw um, the crack, uh, the crack in the the uh, wall of the liberal commitment to the carbon tax with the uh, uh, um, Atlantic heating oil uh, exemption, and it just kind of brought the whole issue to fore, which was basically reinforcing what Pierre has been saying, which is the carbon tax is too expensive, <laughs> and 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 Trudeau gave that to him, and so now the conversation is about getting that further and further along. So yeah, I think he's absolutely on track. I mean, I'm in British Columbia, where you know I am going rushing to fill up my tank of uh, gas right now because it's at a dollar forty seven, which is cheap. Like I haven't seen it at a dollar forty seven since I've lived here. So you know, and I don't I don't drive a lot, but you know, if you if you're if you're somebody that doesn't live in an urban center, the carbon tax is hitting you hard right now. As is groceries, as is everything else, as is interest rates. So yeah, absolutely, he's speaking to people that are looking at their pocketbooks and they're saying this is costing me too much, and I don't see it making any difference. The flip side of all, but the flip side of all of this, all of the conversation, I go back to uh, the Aaron O'Toole year or moments of the uh, of leadership, where they had that convention and there was a motion that was, is climate change real and are we prepared to do anything about it? Now they voted that entire thing down, and I'm not sure whether it was the climate change is real or they were prepared to do something about it. But either way, it's still a problem. And when we start to look at what are we doing about it. So much of this is an infrastructure problem. You know, we we look anywhere in the province of Ontario right now, you can't go snowmobiling. And while that seems a little, who cares, right? But by not having snow, by then you're having ground problems for farmers later on. You're having these increases in wildfires. We saw across the country last year, wildfires, then followed by floods because the ground was too hard. You couldn't get the water in. The carbon tax well, do for that, but I, hold I, on. I, but but I, all, I, of, but all of this is all of this is part and parcel. You can't say, well, we're paying too much for this bit here without recognizing the massive infrastructure money that needs to get spent by all three levels of government. And they need to get start wrapping their heads around how do we do flood protection? How do we build buildings? How do we uh, in, environmental proof our communities? And without having those real conversations that aren't just fun little slogans like ax the tax, but real conversations about how do we actually fix our community so we're not doing mass evacuations because we're having yet another 100 year flood or 50 year fire that should never have happened in the first place, but for the fact that Canada as a whole, and I like to be warm as much as the next person, but Canada as a whole continues to put too much carbon emissions into the environment. So how do we fix that? That's the grown up conversation that we need to have beyond the sloganeering crap. And, and, I, and I think, Kim, you're absolutely correct, because, you know, taxation for all intents and purposes changes behavior in a lot of ways. And I think if we look at, uh, you know, tobacco tax, uh, sin tax on alcohol, it, it, it does change behavior. So I'm, I'm with you on that. And I think that uh, for all intents and purposes, some people, and maybe this is the axe, the tax, uh, the, 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 the sort of the the unintended consequence of the axe the tax slogan that it that that money goes into general revenues that uh, shores up the uh, the government which it doesn't and I think your point is well taken that we're looking at you know innovative uh, investment through that tax into new infrastructure the kinds of things that are really going to change this country I think too and Sarah I've been saying this for a long time we punch way above our weight as a country in terms of uh, the climate change catastrophe that's under that's uh, sort of uh, hitting the entire world right now. And Canada is doing a terrific job. And I think that this is a good way uh, for that to happen. I'd say too, Brian, it, it kind of, um, 
meshes with the, the intent of this particular government right now to look at changing the economy. We're now, uh, the, the entire economy to decarbonize it is something that's really taken hold over the last several years. And I think that Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government are not getting credit for that. You know, I'm biased in this regard. Uh, I did a doctorate in business. Uh, I haven't finished it yet, uh, just to be completely exact, but I did a thesis on uh, carbon tax as the best way to uh, impact climate change. And interesting enough, Sarah, most of the people that I quoted were conservative commentators, both uh, Canadian and American, because the conservative party and 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 more free enterprise oriented people are the people that have usually thought that, uh, as Mark said, taxes are one of the best ways to uh, influence things. Kim, let me turn to a different topic if I could, affordability. Uh, you know, back in the summertime, uh, Justin Trudeau, I think said that uh, affordability um, was not a uh, prime uh, concern of the federal government or prime responsibility of the federal government. But then uh, they've changed things uh, reasonably dramatically with a new housing minister and, and a bunch of different efforts. How do you think that the federal government is currently uh, uh, working with treating the uh, affordability crisis that we've got? So I think there's a couple of different parts to this. When I look at what Sean Fraser has done as minister of housing in his in his work with municipalities and with provincial governments saying, okay, look, we've got money on the table. We're finally putting skin in the game, so to speak, but you have to start building and you have to start upzoning your communities. You have to allow for four story buildings everywhere. The amount, and sometimes if viewers are looking, they will see my NIMBY tears coffee mug. There is nothing I hate more than NIMBYs who will say, oh, we need housing and it's so terrible, the homelessness situation. And they will be the first ones out there protesting against and yelling at their elected officials for any new housing that's being built, whether it is for gas, poor people, or people who want to build multiplexes, because that will bring it, that will change the character of the neighborhood. You want to build housing, you want to get to the affordability crisis, you want to make sure that communities like the town I grew up in continue to have people who can live there and exist there and build that community for the next generation, not everyone always moving into urban centers, you have to start building housing. And so Minister Frazier, to his credit, has gone to these municipalities and said, you want the money? You're going to have to start changing your perspectives and not being so hell-bent on the pitchfork mafia that are so hell-bent against any sort of new development anywhere at any time. And bravo to him now does this help us on our you know a massive amount of money we have to now spend at the grocery store no there are lots of ceos who have gotten extra profits out of this and they will make all sorts of claims it's not on the potatoes that have gone up 25 percent at the grocery store it's because we're selling more lipstick to which i say really and you know this is why the government's going to have to start being serious about this and that's what jagmeet singh and the democrats have pushed on this the broader affordability is something you can you can say it's an affordability crisis, but if you're not prepared to start building housing and get out of the way of housing that needs to get built, you are going to have more and more homelessness happen in every community. And we are having tent cities and communities that never thought they had a homelessness problem. They have significant challenges now, and it's time for time for leadership to step up. But I think you're seeing that, Tim, and a lot of you look at, at Toronto, I think you're seeing that um, we're looking at building uh, in, in terms of the municipal, provincial and the federal governments, uh, modular housing that fits the... the, the I'm seeing, the, I'm the seeing bits of it, Mark, to be frank, you know, other than the fact that, you know, Mississauga is a great example. Yes. If, they, if they didn't get pushed into MZOs and the minister not coming and saying you're not getting a nickel out of housing accelerator fund, there was not going to be that new four-story buildings that had gotten rejected months before by Mississauga City Council. And it wasn't until the Fed said, you're not getting multiple million dollar of housing accelerator fund until you finally get your collective council head uh, into the game of how do we build housing? And they will say, well, we've done so much. Yeah, you're a city. That's what you're supposed to do. It's a dense urban area. It is a community that can do build and grow. How do you do it reasonably? How do you do it responsibly? But municipalities have been pushed into it because the feds were withholding the money. Well, well I you know that uh, um, a lot of those MZOs that you just talked about are being objected to uh, right now by city council. They're always going to be objected to. Every nobody likes being big footed on. It's when they were it, when they were bad planning measures to start with that's when they couldn't stand up to the test. 
ultimately, I have seen so many councils across this country and particularly across this province that have used to rely on the Ontario Municipal Board to uh, do the dirty work on development for you. Oh, darn, that provincial OMB. Really, thank goodness, because most of the most of the tall buildings in most urban centers wouldn't have gotten built the way they were, because except for the OMB. When oh. Kathleen Wynne got rid of it, they got rid of the boogeyman, and then there was all sorts of problems, and that's where uh, we ended up having to have major changes in how we did development chat, uh, development uh, work across. I the was province. chair of the Mississauga City Summit had a uh, panel with uh, Joe Barrage from Urban Strategies and Ken mm -hmm. Greenberg. Uh, um, a renowned uh, uh, developer, uh, planner, and uh, both of them said that the OMB allowed councillors to not have to grow up and yep. act like adults. Hundred percent. Right? Uh, they could get everyone else. They could they could blame the OMB on everything. Know that it would get built and uh, and look like heroes to their uh, to their local constituents. It, we Michelle have to take a break. We've got to take a break for some messages, and we're going to be back in two minutes. And maybe I'll try to turn it. Uh, because we're talking about affordability to provincial issues and see what people have got to say about the provinces. Stay with us, everyone, back in just two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. It's a new year, 2024. It's hard to believe. I, I remember us all celebrating 2020 uh, just recently, and then, bang, we got hit by the pandemic, and things have changed, and politics have changed, and Prime ministers and presidents and uh, premiers and lots of uh, things going on. Uh, and so I thought it'd be really good to do a roundup of what happened in 2023, what we expect and think or or dream will happen in 2024 with some wonderful people that are involved in politics, involved in in business across uh, the country and across our political spectrum. We got Sarah, Sarah McIntyre, uh, who uh, uh, worked with Stephen Harper uh, and Christy Clark in uh, British Columbia and is now in Kelowna, British Columbia, running uh, or, or she's vice president of the Convenience Store Association of, of Canada. Uh, in Mississauga, we've got Mark Keeley, who uh, worked with uh, John Turner and has been involved in liberal politics uh, for a long period of time runs Keeling Associates, a government affairs, public affairs company, and Kim Wright uh, in downtown uh, Toronto, who uh, has been a uh, not an activist. She reminds me on numerous occasions, it's not an NDP activist. She's a public affairs, government affairs advisor. She wants to be in cabinet, not uh, out on the streets uh, protesting. So not an activist. Uh, anyway, Kim Wright, Mark Keeley, Sarah uh, McIntyre, thank you so much for uh, joining. Let's talk well, about provincial politics, if we could. Um, you know, it's it's been an interesting year. Uh, Kim, you were talking about uh, affordability. Uh, we had the, and, and I should preface by saying I'm not going to um, make comments. I'm just going to ask questions on this topic for some uh, potentially obvious reasons. Um, uh, but, you know, Doug Ford uh, made some uh, mistakes in regards to the green belt um, and uh, MZOs. Some people think Ontario Place uh, and uh, the Science Centre as well. Kim, how do you feel about how Doug Ford is doing and what his prospects are right now? I, I look, I think some of it was got over his skis, so to speak, as that as that phrase goes. Are there were there some components of the green belt, uh, the, some of those projects that might have been able to go ahead? Yes, but to do these things in a holist, bolus way was it was very problematic. And political observers and, and GR people, frankly, got whiplash this year from the Doug Ford government. You know, they'd announced something with great, you know, fanfare and social media presence, and then only to have it reversed, you know, weeks or months later. And so how do you plan for those things? How do you, how do you grow a community? How do you plan for a community? And you would have these conversations with mayors, and they're like, you know, we actually don't know right now. So, you know, we'll, when you find out, can you let us know kind of thing? And, and that's not a great way to run a government. And so I hope that steadier hands will start to prevail. This is not a rookie government. This is in their second term. They have lost a lot of good ministers. They've got lost a lot of good staff. But what I will give the premier some credit for uh, is the new deal that he cut with Olivia Chow, Toronto's new mayor. Now, if you remember back to the start of 2023, we had John Tory as the mayor of, of Toronto and, you know, that whole thing. But then we get Olivia Chow, who Doug referred to as an unmitigated disaster during the campaign. Months later, he's cutting one of the biggest, most substantial new municipal, provincial, and hopefully federal deals that we've seen in generations. They took back the Gardner and the DVP, which was downloaded onto, onto Toronto municipal tax base 
uh, in the Harris years. This is massive from an ability, opening up the ability to for Toronto to make better decisions because they're not paying for infrastructure that they were never designed to pay for in the first place. So there's a lot uh, to unpack, to be sure, with the province of Ontario. Uh, but there's some really good things that are that are moving forward. And I'll also give a shout out to uh, a conservative energy minister, Todd Smith. Look, I'm, I'm nice to conservatives. I don't you know. Wow. So it's listen kind of a day. To, listen to but, you, Kim. But his his ability to handle the energy file and to find innovations uh, with what has always been a thorny uh, cabinet post uh, is is really a testament to to Minister Smith and his team. And so special shout out to them. Sarah, you know, uh, Doug Ford and his government uh, uh, very well. Um, I've been shocked that uh, his apologies seem to have been working. Is he the Teflon man? I don't know. I don't know about that, but uh, you know, and I, since I've been out in BC, I don't pay attention too much to what happens in Ontario. Uh, unterrible, we call it out here. Um, <laughs> unterrible. Unterrible. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it was honest. It was earnest. And um, Doug uh, got elected because he, uh, you know, is a straight shooter and, 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 and people realized, Hey, he made a mistake. He got up, he owned it. Um, I think he's a bit bruised from that, but, um, you know, I don't think it's going to take them off course at all in the next, uh, in, in 2024. So, you know, in, in any government, they, as, as Kim mentioned, they're in their second mandate, they're going to have missteps. Um, they, uh, hopefully will, will learn from this misstep. So, you know, um, if consultation first before action. And, um, I think that that's, you know, probably the, the best route that they're going to go. They're going to be a little bit more cautious. Um, it is a government that doesn't like to have, uh, criticism. They're a bit thin skinned. Um, so I'm sure, you know, at the time, this was something that was really occupying the premier's office and, uh, how are we going to get out of this? And, and his apology seemed to be sincere and authentic and, uh, ready to move on to the next issue. Mark, yes. what do you think? You know, you know, my opinion is that Bill Twenty Three, Bill One Hundred Nine, uh, you know, that that the that the provincial government really were trying to do things to uh, attack this affordability crisis, and as uh, you know, Kim was talking about to combat the NIMBYs and their ability to really control uh, what was going on, and yet they seem to have made huge missteps with some MZOs and and uh, an expansion of municipal boundaries, and uh, and clearly uh, the the green belt issue. Do you think that uh, they just got? above their head of their skis. Uh, and so it was just a little misstep or was there corruption or was there a major problem here? Well, I, I look at it. There's a, an old saying that I learned from John Turner. He always used to say in, in politics, people govern people. And so when you, if you, if you use that as sort of the catchphrase uh, for, for how you deal with decisions that are made or people in politics, people govern people. In this particular case, I don't, I think that uh, Sarah made the accurate uh, uh, description of this premier because everything goes back to the premier and that's he's authentic. I think, uh, you know, you're seeing now you've got a new leader of the Liberal Party of Ontario. You've got uh, a pretty decent uh, uh, opposition party with Merritt Stiles. Uh, so I think, look, at I think that he's made the uh, the kinds of apologies and moved on and done some some great things. But I also think he's put good people in place. Vic Fideli is an extraordinary economic development minister, and he's done a terrific job uh, outside of Ontario for Ontario. Uh, I agree with uh, the, the point about Todd Smith. I also think let's look at, at folks like David Piccini, who's a minister of labor. He's done a terrific job, too, in his role. And then look at uh, George Peary in uh, northern Ontario. We This has become a great province right now with an innovation agenda, uh, a real um, tribute to the to the province in terms of being activists on economic development in other places too. I'd even go one step further and say, you're seeing in parts of the province where you haven't seen it before, huge infill development opportunities that are, are supported and backfilled by uh, the, the province with uh, them as a, as a good partner with municipalities. So I think Ontario is being served very well right now. So yeah, I, we, uh, a couple of things, though, I wanted to say, and I'll get to your question in a second, Brian, but none of this, all of this policy back and forth and shenanigans gets away from the fact that in the province of Ontario alone, we are 2 million units of housing short. Think about that, 2 million. That would be basically most of Toronto, everyone gets a house. 
Wait, we put that across the problem. It's like but, but can you, you can't blame you can't blame four years of I can't I can't, but what I can't but what I can do is say enough of the finger pointing, enough of the da 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 da. We've got a major problem with that. We've got emergency rooms that are closing permanently, substantially. We are we have spent gobsmacking amounts of money in the Ministry of Health. And somehow my mother-in-law has to wait months and months and years to get her hip replacement surgery. This is not what Ontario thought they were. And this, you can say it's 40 years of this or that, but today a government has been in power for into their second term and still are, we are having more and more emergency room closures. I'll give Mara Styles credit. She made a, she made the quip of the year from my perspective, which is, is government policy being made on massage, par massage parley tables in Vegas? Maybe that's what we need to do, but that's not where Ontarians are at, but we have major problems and this back and forth has got to stop if we're actually going to start to tackle them in a serious way. But I agree. Back, what you're talking it's about. Gotta, it's got to be rich an NDP joke about massage parlors, Kim. <laughs> but i i here's the other side of this is you've got you know these huge housing deficits in and emergency room closures and we're experiencing the same thing in bc as, mm -hmm. as ontario and then you've got half a million immigrants slated to come in for the into the country this year so it's it's like the one hand is not talking to the other if we can't adequately get shovels in the ground and build homes and infrastructure for the people that we have and provide medical care for the people that are living here and paying taxes. I, I, I just don't understand why there's this huge push to pull in more, more immigration and higher numbers than we've ever seen before. And you hear it from the, it's this conversation that no one's talking to each other. Developers are like, well, we need labor. We need people to come in and build. And so the federal government increases immigration numbers. And then we bring in more people and they come to the cities and there's no houses. And it's this circular argument. And, you know, we can say it's the municipality's fault all we want, but at the end of the day, it's a demand and supply issue. Well, it's also, I think there there needs to be, and we're talking about the provinces. I think that the, the feds and the provinces have to do a better job of collaborating and, and cooperating on issues. I think, I, I love this idea or this um, uh, example I heard the other day about New Brunswick saying we need more housing in New Brunswick. And then the construction industry said, yeah, but we just don't have the workers. So they said, we'll get more immigrants to come into New Brunswick. Well, you don't need new immigrants per se. You need new skilled trade workers from other countries. And these are the conversations that need to take place. From coast to coast, we need this kind of a discussion. There's no Gosh, question. if only there... I had a table of the Federation to deal. Oh, wait, no, we do. And all <laughs> they do is spend all of their time finger pointing and blaming and putting yes. out a lovely press release at the end of the day. But, it, you know, look, this goes back to why is there an abysmal voter turnout? Why are we at 30 percent, 25 percent less than that in some places? Why are we barely scraping to 40 in, in some provincial and, and, and even in federal writings? It's because everyone is so tired of the finger pointing. We can't get clean drinking water sorted out in this country. And oh, it's this person's fault or that person's fault. We can we can send the Canadian military all around the world to help get new drinking water up and running in, in, a, in a catastrophe. Somehow in indigenous communities, people are drinking stuff that they wouldn't even have served in Flint, Michigan. And somehow we're okay with that. But we, have made, we have made it a political football to toss back and forth. That is why people are getting so despondent. Ontarians, Canadians, every municipality, everybody is looking for somebody to stand up and say, it's not just about the press release. It's we're actually going to do this. We're going to cut through the crap. We're going to cut through the we're blaming the last 40 years or the last 10 years of this government or this political stripe. We want people to get on with it. Our but decision Kim, makers need to get on with it. Kim, we don't seem to be able to do that, though. No, because no, it's easier uh, to uh, score uh, cheap it's, points. It's, it's CMHC, StatsCan, numerous different organizations have done the study saying that it is it takes longer to get approvals for housing in Canada mm -hmm. than anywhere else in the OECD. And that it takes longer to get natural resource developments approved um, with you know, no certainty whatsoever, such that mining companies, oil and gas companies, et cetera, are just developing elsewhere because they just don't know whether they can actually ever get an approval. So, you know, there is some, but it may be the NIMBYs that are out there that are complaining, but it's government personnel it's the governments that, that are, are putting up with that and allowing it. No, it, you're absolutely right. I have, I have projects 
that I got brought in on recently that is literally 40 years in the making of a development file. Tell me how that is appropriate anywhere. There are easy 10, 10-year, 10 15-year projects. That is just not acceptable. And this goes back to, do elected officials want to get reelected because it's easier to placate the people who are already there than build the community they want? And the, and the vote in that 30% turnout that you were talking about. And, Sarah, and, yeah. So, I'm going to ask you, Sarah, that the, the NDP government in BC recently passed a law. I'm not sure of the details of it, but from what I understand is if you're within 400 meters of a uh, transit exchange, so so this would not only be for the SkyTrain uh, stations, but for bus uh, you know, uh, transfer points, you can get a minimum zoning without need to go to any city planning process of 12 stories. Uh, which is sort of like the as of right that Kim was talking about earlier of being able to build uh, fourplexes uh, uh, as of right uh, zoning. Uh, and NDP government uh, did that, overriding completely NIMBYs and and, uh, and and city planning staff. Is that the kind of top-down uh, effort that we need to uh, have take place to, to to solve some of this? I don't know. I mean, I if I don't know what the solutions are. I'm not a developer. You know, I I I don't have a magic plan that I've been working on here in Kelowna that I'm just waiting to unveil right now. But you know, I think people are looking at any effort at all to clear the blocks to get shovels in the ground is a good thing. It does have other impacts. So I I haven't really looked at this particular bill in in detail, but the, you know, David Eby, Eby before he was premier was housing minister. So he this is a file that he knows very well. He's very well liked. He's very pr pragmatic. Um, and, you know, I think he recognizes that people just can't live in, in this province anymore that, I mean, rents and, and real estate have just skyrocketed just like Ontario and in, in the Toronto area. And, and there's a huge, huge problem. And of course it runs into, you know, the municipalities and, and what they're passing. And there's some municipalities here now that you can't even build a single family dwelling. You can't get a permit for that. Yeah. It has to be densification. It has to be multifamily homes. Like in Squamish, you cannot build a family home and get a permit for that, which is astonishing to me that, you know, a, a municipal government can block you from actually building a home in, in an area. But but that that being said, I look, I, I think the, the problems are complex. They didn't just happen overnight. Uh, interest rates in, increasing at the same time as this crisis has just made things all the worse for everyone uh, from the developer to the to the homeowner. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that it makes sense to have densification near transit systems. And, you know, this is BC's trying something new they they also brought in some some uh limits with airbnbs that are that are getting a lot of backlash as well um a lot of people are blaming airbnb for the short-term rental market basically evaporating in the province um and in the country um you know and you can't blame homeowners for doing that as their mortgage rates are going up they're looking for supplemental income so why not airbnb their property as opposed My to house. why don't i have the right to do with it what i want yeah, it's yeah. Government. Tell me I can't rent so, it out. There's always going to be a rub between, you know, broader social goals and individual uh, individual rights. And, you know, striking that balance is 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 a difficult one, but that's what leaders are elected to do. Can I, and, and look, and I, think, I think that's why you've got a pretty good decisiveness in British Columbia. I, I like the idea that uh, the government wants densification, uh, Sarah. And I think that speaks exactly to your issue on Airbnbs and Bs. I think in, in a lot of ways, if you... If you had more densification, you'd have more uh, you'd have more opportunities for people to get housing. And I think you're seeing that in, even in smaller communities and other provinces as well. We're just not giving credit a lot of times, Brian, to uh, premiers in other provinces. I think that everybody hates Daniel Smith. I don't know why, but uh, I think she's becoming very I think she's becoming very decisive in terms of what she wants to do in changing the economy in in in, uh, in Alberta. And look what's happening. Calgary is one of the best places to live right now. And I think that uh, over the last three years, that's really uh, done well for her. Look at uh, look at Manitoba. We've got a fantastic premier in Manitoba right now that people are saying this brings huge uh, incentive to want to look at what's going to happen in that province. And kudos to the NDP government there too. So I, I think in 2024, 
this maybe speaks to what Kim had said. We got to look at, you know, that that there's some really good decisive governments in this country. And that ought to get people out off their duffs to say, I got to get I got to get more involved in in politics in one way, shape or form, because this is a really damn good country right now. And uh, in 2024, we're going to I think we're going to see some pretty interesting things happen. That's going to and I keep saying this, too, that's going to demonstrate that Canada at the municipal, provincial and le federal levels punches above its weight. I, I hope to God you're right, because I'm not nearly as optimistic. I was out in uh, Vancouver and Victoria recently, uh, uh, Sarah, and uh, and the homelessness problem uh, that I saw in the streets was astounding. And, uh, you know, Mark and uh, and Kim, I think you see it in, uh, I, in, in Toronto as well. I yeah. interviewed someone just yesterday who talked about it's in Mississauga, it's in Whitby, and it's in Ajax, but they're yeah. they're not seen as well because they're they're sleeping in cars. Uh, um, I think that you know, Kim, you've talked about emergency room problems and hospital problems, and and we've talked just now about affordability. But am I wrong? Has homelessness been become a far bigger issue than it was in the past? Homelessness is is there's always been a hidden homelessness, and you know, you didn't it wasn't so much in your face. Uh, in the legis in the Ontario legislature, uh, MPP John Bantoff, a New Democrat MP from uh, Timiskaming, talked about how in his community there's tent cities. That was just unfathomable. Uh, to every community is now facing this. Part of this is a mental health problem. Part of this is a housing crisis. There is not a place in this country you can have a minimum wage job and afford a one bedroom apartment, if you can even find one. Let that sink in. You cannot have a minimum wage job anywhere in the country and afford a one bedroom. That is staggering to people. So you know why you can't be, you know, we're not building single family homes in Squamish because they actually need to start building multiplexes. They need to start building more things. This notion that everybody gets, you know, five acres of land and, you know, and that's going to, and it's all going to bibbity bobbity boop and there will no, be no more housing. That's not what we're facing. This is a multi-pronged issue. You can't just send people to the urban centers anymore. That's not, make, it's not cutting it. And so now you're seeing this more and more into every community. And it, it is the responsibility of governments who collect taxes on behalf of the collective to figure out what are the programming things that are necessary. Do we need to have mental health workers that go almost uh, to community to community? I always say take over a legion hall in every small town and once a week the uh, a, a, like a, a mental health worker can come in and do casework in that community because they can't drive three towns over because there's no longer inter-agency inter buses anymore. There are so many component pieces of this. If you think that Airbnbs are why we have a homelessness problem, give your heads a shake. That is the abdication of responsibility of municipal leaders of not building housing. It is bad, bad supply management. You have to understand why people are airbnb -ing. You also have to look at what the benefit for tourism. And no, I'm not the lobbyist for Airbnb. I just look at what are the actual issues here and what are the challenges. And Airbnb is the convenient scapegoat for a house uh, for a homelessness problem that municipalities would want to deal with. Last thing I'll say on this at the moment, I'll say, uh, is a couple of years back, uh, John Tory, Mayor uh, John Tory, uh, evacuated and cleared out uh, Lamport Stadium because there was an encampment there a couple of summers ago. The amount of money they paid for policing, they could have actually housed every single one of those people for at least a year. And we didn't do that. We actually, and so again, budgets are choosing where your priorities are. They put that into destroying an encampment and not housing people. Well, there's been a lot of studies uh, that have come out. Um, uh, I was at a recent uh, real estate development conference with a bunch of developers where uh, someone from the stand uh, said uh, that uh, economically, it's far better to build people housing than it is to allow them to stay homeless because of uh, exactly what you're talking about. Emergency room visitation, um, uh, policing, uh, dealing with uh, the issues of uh, of crime, mental health, etc., uh, in a in an uncontrolled on the street uh, manner, uh, it is cheaper to actually build them uh, houses. Mark, I want to ask you a question, if I could. Um, you know, this uh, whether it was the emergency, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, review 
that occurred last uh, winter that said that uh, that government just wasn't working, uh, that uh, that provin- provincial governments and federal governments weren't talking together and different departments uh, yeah. and uh, and CSIS weren't communicating uh, and or frankly, uh, you know, people that have come out and said that uh, the, the federal government isn't listening to CSIS uh, because uh, they had to go to to people that would disclose what was going on in China. Um, uh, you know, it seems like government is part of the problem here that it's not working well amongst itself and amongst the different levels of government. Uh, Is that a concern that you've got? It's a big concern, Brian. And let me give you, this as a very tangible example. We do an awful lot of work outside of Canada in the development of healthcare and and, uh, energy projects. I'll tell you in other countries, Mexico, China, Vietnam, uh, Pakistan, India, uh, Colombia, they think that the Canadian healthcare system equals quality. So when they say you can fly a Canadian flag and build a, a healthcare project here, we know that people are going to go because they think that that uh, the Canadian healthcare system is the best on planet Earth, except here in Canada. For energy projects, they think, wow, you've done an extraordinary job with things like battery energy storage in Canada. And in other countries, they're looking at battery energy storage in the Canadian context as quality, except here in Canada. We bitch and bellyache in this country all the time about how horrible things are. But the reason why it's horrible is because we're not talking. The provincial uh, governments don't talk with the feds. And we haven't, I'll just say, probably the best, most collaborative government we had in this country was when Brian Mulroney was prime minister because we had FedProv conferences all the time. We haven't had one in the in in uh, very very seldom do we have a FedProv conference between this current federal government and the provinces. The same thing with municipal governments. I listened to what Kim had said. The government of Ontario, just as an example, put in place this extraordinary initiative with the IESO on doing on on transforming uh, grids in in certain parts of the of the province to allow for battery energy storage storage and and municipal governments are saying don't want it. So these ki- these are the kinds of things that I think what we need is a very rich discussion in this country right now on how we deal with good governance. We just don't have it. I've been saying the biggest problem in healthcare is not the delivery of healthcare, it's governance. And we we have a uh, we have to look at that. We have to force better governance, put better people on boards for hospitals, put better people on on boards for uh, agencies that help deliver the kinds of things that ha- that need to be delivered in this province. And that to my way of thinking Brian is going to do an excellent job of turning around the way we uh, operate and collaborate as a country. Well, it raises an issue that I wanted to raise uh, to to end this conversation, which I'll do right after our final break. And that is democracy. Uh, Do we have a good democracy or is it being challenged today? Uh, We're going to take a break and come back with some concluding comments in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. I've got Kim Wright from the NDP, not from the NDP, but an NDP. Or I've got Mark Keeley, uh, a, a former uh, very involved liberal, and Sarah McIntyre, a very involved uh, conservative, uh, talking about a political roundup. And I want to ask you one big question, if I could. At least I think it's a really big question. I was uh, at my uh, my business school reunion back in the fall, and a professor stood up and did quite a long review of how he said democracy was at risk. And uh, the number of uh, free countries worldwide had uh, diminished and free elections had gone down. Even when they had elections, they were fake free elections. They weren't really free elections. And just this weekend, the Globe Mail did a major story on uh, on how democracy uh, is at risk worldwide, globally. Uh, And they said that 50 percent of the world's population are going to be voting this year, but that a lot of the the votes won't actually be free. And that it's as an extension, not just the challenge of democracy with authoritarian leaders uh, uh, that uh, uh, are there and, and trying to get elected and getting elected and, and and acting very authoritarian, but it's concentration in leaders' offices, PMOs, premier's office, et cetera. And so therefore we have a lack of democracy. So I got to ask you, Sarah, is democracy healthy or is it risk? Uh, well, I, I think it's always at risk. That's the nature of democracy. It, it relies upon the motivation of the individual and the the actions of the leader. And the leader is just a reflection of the individual. If people are turning off of politics, then you get a leader that's kind of um, that's got free free reign. I I think um, it, it, we should always consider it in peril because it's very important. And if you don't consider it in peril, then you're not tending to it. Um, I, and I think. 
what happens with politics, you know, in recent years is that people see it as a thankless, tough job, but it attracts a certain type of personality. It attracts a certain type of people that to be able to withdure, with, withstand that or be attracted to that, um, it's a, it, it takes a certain type of, of character. And, and, and that may mean that it's always a bit nasty. And so we don't have we don't elect our best and brightest we elect those that are on the ballot and 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 i think that's a perennial problem um power concentration in leaders offices has always been a problem i mean i remember in in, in politics reading governing from the center you know D donald savoy writing about the increased power concentration under pierre elliott trudeau in, in the pmo it's it's always been a feature and i i think for those that study and watch and participate we're always feeling that it is a bit in peril and 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 i think it it, it should always be something that we take time and and, and care for and should always be talking about and should always be thinking about how do we increase the franchise and and how do we get people attracted to politics um and you know it, it's it's tough to do when you're in the world of sound bites and and that's where we're at right now so um i don't think we're any worse than we were 10 years ago but i don't think we're any better either pim you talked about the decline in uh, in voter turnout are we worse today so I look at it as, and look, I'm, I've am i been in politics now since, since 1990, so please don't do the math, uh, but a, a, a day or two. Why, why do I stay in politics? Why do I stay in public affairs? Because I actually believe in the best in people and the best in how do we build communities. We look at what are the problems and how do we solve them. That politics is public service and public good. It's when we as the political class start to say, oh, democracy is crap, you know, voters are stupid, like all of the terrible tropes that we start to see a decline in, in voter engagement because politics isn't engaging with people and people feel then absent from, from the politics. Ultimately, most people I know who are in politics and public affairs are trying their best to do their best now. I may differ of how they approach things. I may have very different approaches than Pierre does. But I know fundamentally what he's trying to do is try to do decent things. Every elected official is trying to do their best. But what I don't see coming out of many staffers coming in, and part of this I'll blame Guy Giorno for uh, putting in restrictions on people coming in and out of government because you're not having the mentorship, you're not having the the, the folks coming in uh, and being able to lift up uh, for, for you know cause and country. There isn't a curiosity, a natural curiosity uh, of staffers, of politicians. They get handed their talking points and say, okay, I'll go read this speech. They're not doing the research. They're not looking at, they're not going and traveling around and going, oh, that's how they close that street. Or, oh, that's how they deal with this here. Could we do this? Why is this thing buried on page 52 of an 87 page report? Who is benefiting from this? Is there something that is good here? Is there something deficient here? Is there something that we can do to enhance? That lack of natural curiosity and the lack of swagger and optimism from the political class is, to my mind, what is causing this most significant decrease in, in community and voter engagement. It's not that people don't want better. It's not that they don't want to help their neighbors and their friends and, the, and build, the, build the new rink. They all want to do that. They need to help be, be enabled by it. And that's the fault of the, frankly, the political class of not having enough swagger coming in there to figure not it have out. Enough, not have enough swagger. That's interesting. Uh, Mark, you know, one of the criticisms that I've heard a lot of uh, in regards to the Liberal Party federally in this regard is that uh, that it's a cult of one individual rather than a, the political party that it was uh, in the past. And that in the past, there were already always people that were you know, maybe right of center, at least center, as well as left of center, uh, business people, Bay Street people like John Turner, uh, as well as uh, people that were far more progressive and that uh, the current cabinet uh, doesn't have, uh, you know, many people that are from Bay Street or are, are business oriented. It, it ends up being just a, a very progressive and maybe Jagmeet Singh and the, and the supply and confidence, uh, uh, you know, moved it that way, uh, forced it that way. Uh, and or maybe it's uh, the current uh, prime minister that moved it that way. What do you think? Is the political party uh, in power today, not broad enough? 
Well, look at I, I, let me let me give you this as a, a another tangible example of of where uh, I think people have have really focused in maybe too um, uh, minutely on Justin Trudeau. You know, this country was founded in 1867. I, I think uh, one of the best uh, uh, political minds that this country ever developed was Sir John A. Macdonald. And if you if you hearken back to uh, any history book around how Sir John A. Macdonald ran his his government and ran his party, he was at the center of everything. And so when I look at what you know, he he built that party. It was in his own image. It was uh, by his personality, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same thing from 1867 as we're seeing today. So, uh, you know, this this idea that, oh, we've uh, we've lost all sense of democracy because Justin Trudeau is a cult. Look, he's built this party. He handpicked everybody that that um, uh, he wanted to see run for him. And uh, he won a massive majority in 2015. It, look, uh, the fact that that we've had successive uh, issues post 2015, he, he's still the, the government. And I think that we're seeing a, a better Canada as a result. But. John Turner always taught me this. He said, democracy doesn't happen by accident. And to what Kim and Sarah are saying, and even, Brian, to what you've always been saying, we got to work really hard at this. And I think we owe it to ourselves as people who are in this business and who are part of political machines to actually uh, to do a better job. I think we got to we got to do better to even put things in curricula, whether it's at the provincial level or at university levels, to get people to really understand the value of democracy. Uh, I, I find it fascinating, too, when people say, you know, being elected is like being on a board of a company. Nose is in, hands off. I don't agree with that. Once you're elected, you should be as active as you possibly can to make things happen. And sometimes what I'm seeing, especially with folks who, I hate the word backbencher, and every time I see a, a member say that, I always send them a note saying, stop calling yourself a backbencher. You should never have to ask your leader for a meeting. You should be able to get in there when you need as, as quickly and as possibly as you can, and you should never be uh, forced not to say anything in the House of Commons, which is the, uh, the place to talk. They call it parliament for a reason, to speak. Speak. So I think these are the kinds of things that we really got to celebrate with people about government. And look, it's exciting. CBC just did a an end of year. Mark, I got to cut you off. I apologize. We're out of time. Thank wow. you so much. Mark Keeley, Kim Wright, Sarah McIntyre. Thank you so much. That's our show for tonight, everyone. I'm on every night, six o'clock on 960 AM. Good night, everyone. Happy New Year, everyone.